autumn rollout of um, COVID and flu jabs. It's been brought forward to start today. It comes after an outbreak of a new strain that's been called Parola at a care home in Norfolk. Mm. We're joined from Westminster by Professor Susan Hopkins, the Chief Medical Advisor at the UK Health Security Agency. Thank you for joining us. Could you just start by explaining who is qu going to qualify in the first wave for the vaccines and why have you decided to bring them forward? Thank you very much. So we're bringing forward the vaccines today because of the new BA 2.86 uh, variant that was detected a number of weeks ago. It's a highly precautionary measure and it's there to boost the immunity and prevent hospitalizations and severe illness for those most at risk. And those are the over 65s, particularly those in adult social care and care homes. Uh, and that starts today for those groups. Um, then those in clinical risk groups, so those who people who have been identified as being immunosuppressed or having other risk factors for severe disease. And finally, those people who live with those individuals who are um, uh, in clinical risk groups. And we would ask all of those people to come forward when they're called. And it, uh, Sorry, is the plan to um, also bring forward the date for the availability of the vaccine for other groups? Will the over 50s be brought forward too? So we're not recommending vaccine routinely for the over 50s, between 50 and 65, unless you're in a clinical risk group. So if I... you're in a clinical risk group um, from the age of uh, six months, uh, you will be uh, offered vaccine. And what is the reason for that? Is that because there aren't enough vaccines? Is it that there is a financial constraint? Is it you think it's not good for us to be taking these vaccines? Because as I understand it in America, um, the American president is saying that all Americans um, are to be given the vaccine again um, over the coming months. Why in America, but not here in Britain? So first of all, we look at the individuals who are most at risk of severe disease and hospitalisation and we prioritise vaccine for those. Um, that's based on the same methodology as we do for flu vaccine, for example. Um, so we are prioritising vaccine for those at most risk of severe disease and hospitalisation. So many people in clinical risk groups and in the over 65s, that's about 27 million people in our population. Uh, and we're recommending that those people come forward. And how far does um, the booster... Uh, deal with this particular new strain? Or have you changed what's in the vaccine in order to deal with this new strain? Do you have to keep updating uh, what, what we're getting in our jabs? So we're, we'll be vaccinating with the vaccines that are latest vaccines that are available to us. Um, we, it takes a number of weeks and months for a new vaccine strain uh, to be developed. And we wouldn't expect, if we needed to, to see the new vaccine um, developed for this strain to be available for a number of months yet. Uh, so that means that we vaccinate the latest strains that are available. We know that these vaccines will provide a boost to the immunity and provide a broad immune response, uh, providing protection from severe disease and hospitalisation. And can I just ask you, what, um, what, are the symptoms very different or more severe with this new strain? I'm just wondering, you know, we're getting into that season, you know, school started, everyone's getting back, we're get, the weather's going to get worse eventually, we'll all be indoors more. Um, I just wonder what your advice is, you know, do you think that we should be doing the home testing again as we get into people feeling ill again? What should we be looking out for, things like that? Yeah, so firstly, the main things are the symptoms are unchanged so far that we can see, but very few cases yet. And so we'll be watching signs for severity signals in particular. Uh, we've given advice for the last year and a half or so now on how to manage respiratory infections. And that includes, you know, if you're feeling unwell um, uh, with high fever for children and you, they're very unwell to stay at home from school, but otherwise for mild illnesses to keep going because school's really important. For um, other people, uh, I think the main thing is, is that if you can stay at home and you're unwell with a respiratory infection, any respiratory infection, then you should. If you need to go out, then protect the, particularly the vulnerable or those risk of severe disease. Avoid visiting them if at all possible. And if you do need to uh, provide care or visit somebody, see what precautions that you can take to prevent passing on this infection. Can I go back to the question I asked you a moment ago? Because we're saying that other than for clinically at risk groups, the vaccine is only available for the over 65s. Uh, the Americans are talking about it being available to all of the adult population, in fact, um, teenagers as well. Is America the outlier here? Is Britain doing the same as other countries around the world? Or are we in Britain taking a restrictive approach by not making the vaccine available to people in their 30s, 40s and 50s in the way that we did 
last year and the year before? So I think the first thing I would say is that vaccines are there to prevent severe disease. And we know that people who are most at risk of severe disease are in clinical risk groups or the over 65s. That's why we're vaccinating those individuals. For other individuals, the number needed to vaccinate is extremely high. To prevent um, uh, severe disease, we're talking about hundreds of thousands in, in, the, um, uh, in the younger age groups. And therefore, the um, advice that JCVI have recommended to government and government have accepted is that we vaccinate and prioritise those at risk of severe disease. That's what we're doing. Um, we know that we have very high uptakes in this group and that's what we're going to keep encouraging and, and working with people to understand why that's the case. And most other countries are doing the same? Uh, I think lots of countries in Europe are doing a very similar approach. Uh, I think there's always different approaches taken around the world. But we have a very effective vaccine programme in the UK and we will continue to provide vaccines for those most at risk. And just a final word from you on, on masks and whether we'll see them return in any big way, you think, um, in the next few months, but also just on the efficacy of them, because it was... You know, there was all sorts of percentages being thrown around about actually the masks don't really even work that much. It's just sort of more of a personal comfort, really. So I think there's um, clearly when you look at the masks themselves, a barrier to, uh, to preventing you, what you exhale, what you cough and sneeze going to other people are going to provide a barrier to uh, if you're infecting others, if you are self are infected. If you're wearing a well-fitting mask, then that can also help you acquire infection from the air that you're breathing um, uh, and from coughs and sneezes that may be approaching you. Uh, what we know, though, is that the vast majority of protection is delivered by the vaccine. And therefore, what we're doing is recommending that approach as the primary approach on the way forward. And you There's wouldn't wear a mask in um, normal life? So I'm not wearing a mask at the moment. If there was lots of uh, new infection around that I didn't know the risks for and I was worried about, then I would. If I had co symptoms of a cold or flu and I needed to leave the house and I couldn't stay at home, then I would to protect others. Um, but on routine day-to-day -day life, I think the heavy lifting is now done by vaccines. Right, Professor Susan Hopkins, uh, great to have you on the show. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.